Hi, Pastor Steve Talmadge of Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. Each week, Pastor Nanette Christofferson or I try to provide a brief introduction to uh, two of the assigned lectionary readings for the upcoming Sunday. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the reading, the Gospel, for Sunday, September 10th, 2023, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Matthew 16, 13 to 20, 34 is the section of Matthew's gospel that we're in. And it's setting the stage for Jesus finally arriving in Jerusalem. That's Holy Week, Palm Sunday. The events of that week leading up to Monday, Thursday, uh, the Lord's uh, Last Supper, uh, the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the suffering and, and imprisonment by the Jewish authorities, and then being hauled to uh, Pilate uh, to get the a sentence of crucifixion. All that's uh, laying before the disciples and Jesus. And Jesus is trying to set the stage and prepare his disciples for what's going to happen there. The question that we've been wrestling with, we had it last uh, Sunday when Pastor Annette uh, preached and brought, brought this uh, video lesson, is who is Jesus? Who, what are the people, uh, who do the people say that Jesus is? And then to the disciples, who do you say I am? And we get Peter's confession. We know Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, but that leads to a bigger question. What kind of Christ? What kind of Messiah? Leading up to uh, our uh, lesson, we have in chapter 17, uh, the transfiguration. Jesus cures a boy with a demon. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Uh, Jesus and the temple uh, attacks. So we have in, in 16, we have Peter confessing who Jesus is, but then seeing in last Sunday's gospel that I did, uh, Peter didn't understand what kind of Messiah Jesus is because he already tells them, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested, suffer at the hands of the leadership and die. And then on the uh, third day, rise again. And uh, I think many of the disciples stopped when they heard death uh, and they're wondering what the heck did we sign up for? Well, then we go to Mount, uh, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration in 17. We get Peter, James, and John. So we have three eyewitnesses uh, that come and they see Moses and Elijah uh, with Jesus on the Mount. And we hear God's voice say, this is my son, listen to him. We get deep symbolism of Jesus is the one who fulfills both the law and the prophets, symbolized in Moses and Elijah. And we get an affirmation of who Jesus is, pointing back to his baptism uh, and pointing back to Peter's confession. Uh, then he demonstrates the restoration and, and reconciliation uh, of, of, of the kingdom of God on earth through the power of healing a boy, uh, curing him of a demon. Again, a second time here. He foretells his death and resurrection. And again, I don't think the disciples want to hear it. And then we see the opposition show up and try to trip him up on, is it right to pay the tax, temple tax or not? And, you know, this is a controversial deal because uh, many of the people of the crowd feel that that temple tax is unjust. And, uh, and they're seeing, is Jesus going to side with supporting the temple? which is in our tradition, or is Jesus going to uh, lead a revolution of the people against the temple? 18, 1 to 5, we get a little lesson about true greatness, and Jesus takes up a child and lifts up to the disciples. This is true greatness, the faith of a child. Unless you change and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a hard lesson for many of us, right? We need to be humble like a child. Uh, we need to welcome children in his name because children have an innocence about them and they have an ability to trust uh, in God. They have an ability to trust in adults uh, and they have an ability uh, that want to play and work and be in community with others. So Jesus is saying true greatness is to be found in children. And if you don't get that, and you become a stumbling block to one of those, it's better off that you get a big millstone put around your neck 
and thrown into the Mediterranean Sea or the Sea of Galilee, and that's not going to work out. 6 to 9 and 18 leading up to our lesson are the temptations to sin, and he's urging his disciples to take seriously what his life, his ministry, and his mission are, to take seriously what kind of Messiah he is, and unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees who have become stumbling blocks to God's people, the, the, the Jews, he says, woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. We need to be very, very careful about how we speak for God, speak about God, act like God, that often is, is, is the excuse or the justification for people to run away from the church, to run away from Jesus, to run away from organized religion, because we humans have become stumbling blocks, being more concerned of being in control, being authorities, uh, being in power, rather than humbling ourselves like a child and recognizing we're all dependent on God's unconditional love, his grace and mercy and forgiveness. And Jesus uses very strong language here uh, to make the point. Then we get the parable of the lost sheep. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, little ones could be children. Little ones could be people who've never heard the gospel, who have never known who Jesus is, or maybe... Their only image of God is this horrific image of one who sits in, in wait to judge and damn and condemn people. Jesus wants to correct that and say, no, the God revealed in me is one who goes after the lost sheep, the vulnerable, the little one, and is willing to lead the 99 that haven't gone astray, that already know who God is, to find the little one so they don't get lost. Then we need to deal with an offense in Christian community or in the community of the faithful. So this is our lesson. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Notice, are alone. The church, in my 38, 39 years of being a pastor, can often be one of the most passive, aggressive organizations around where people don't want to confront one another, go to one another, and when there's a, a, a misunderstanding or a real offense, they'd rather go talk to other people about what that person has done to them rather than go to that person initially and try to work things out. This, this is Jesus' direction to his disciples. If something has been broken in a relationship with another, we have a responsibility to take the initiative and not sit in our hurt or sit in our judgment and wait for that person to move. If the member listens to you, you've regained that one. We're in the business of restoration, reconciliation, of rebuilding community, not you know picking sides and developing allies to gang up upon another. 16. But if you're not listened to, and that happens sometimes. Sometimes in relationships, pride, stubbornness uh, gets in the way. And, and there's no desire to seek reconciliation or understanding. Well then, because the witness of the community to the unbelieving world, to those outside the faith community, are hurt when we don't know how to get our own act together. Jesus says, take one or two others along with you. These are one or two other Christian brothers or sisters with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Jesus is saying, if you can't work it out yourself, then bring some others along with the goal of trying to regain this relationship and to make sure we don't get caught in a he said, she said, he said, he said, she said, she said situation. And then 17, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This, this sounds kind of harsh, but I want you to frame this, that, that 
the initial teaching here is all about restoration, reconciliation, and doing it in the most private, caring way, and then expanding that if the first attempt doesn't work, to bring in a few others who also understand our goal here is restoration and reconciliation, not ganging up, beating up, and making sure that the person who offended knows how much of an offender they are. And then still, if they refuse to listen, then bring it to the larger community so that they also can say, we care about the direction your life is going. We care about the behavior that is impacting or infecting others in this place. We care about the struggle that's happening here. And we want to find a path forward so that we can work this out. But if that person says, I refuse, then we need to let that person go. In Matthew, in his context, first century, treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. And in Jewish society, those are the people you avoid. Uh, they are, they are uh, unclean. The Gentile's unclean and the tax collector is an employee of the Roman Empire. And then our conclusion. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This goes back again to Peter, you know, being given the keys to the kingdom and the power of confession and the gift of forgiveness that all Christians are entrusted with, the ability to let people free by offering a word of forgiveness. Jesus says again, Truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. You've got to keep this verse in context. Jesus is not say, if two of us go and say, I want a million dollars, that God's going to give us a million dollars. This is in the context of broken community, broken relationships. And, and, and our heart's desire is to agree that our goal is to be agents of restoration and reconciliation of uh, being in the business of uh, of inviting people back into community and and not holding whatever they've said or done against them and 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 carrying a grudge and or desiring vengeance and then we have this assurance in verse 20 for where two or three are gathered in my name I am there among them and this is this is part of that earlier witness when we're involved in conflict resolution, when we're involved in a broken relationship, Jesus is there in the middle of it. And let us pray to Jesus to give us the help and the wisdom we need. I hope you'll wrestle with this text as you prepare for uh, Sunday. God bless you.